Welcome everybody to the Hardcore Heritage Collaborative. We are so excited today. We have Roland McCready, uh, Director of Research for HeartMath with us today. It's truly an honor. It's so exciting to have you here. As we were just saying to you, you've been sort of like a figure that we've watched videos of you, we've studied your stuff, and now it's so exciting that you came here to talk to the Heart Coherence Collaborative. Yeah. So thank you. Well, it's my honor. And and I let me start by saying I, I think it's wonderful and really exciting what you guys are doing and what you've put together. And, and I wish more people would take the initiative to, to do these kinds of things and have the these heart coherence challenges and the things that you're doing is awesome. So my hat's off to you. Thank you. Yeah, you are kind of like the man behind the scenes making all the magic happen. <laughs> yeah. So we're excited for an incredible interview to unfold. But first, you were so generous to, to offer us the guided technique. So if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about that technique and, and we'll let you just lead the way. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. The, um, what I was kind of thinking about this when you asked me, uh, Kyle, was uh, the, the shift and lift is the name of the technique. And it's um, one that's in a, our, our one of our certification programs, programs called Activating the Heart of Teams, which is a program for helping bring, it's not just teams, but social coherence, people more together in the heart. How do we kind of rise above old histories and stuff like that is what the, the program is, is all about. But it, this is one of the techniques from it called Shift and Lift. And probably a lot of your uh, people watching this might be familiar with the heart lock-in technique. I assume you've taught that. So it's going to sound somewhat similar, but it's quite different in that where heart lock-in is kind of meant to be, you know, a, like a heart meditation. I'm going to go off and close my eyes and really be able to deeply lock in and sustain coherence and, you know, the connection with your your uh, larger yourself, your heart intelligence for longer periods. It's going to sound similar, but this technique is something that you can intentionally use with your eyes open right when you're having a conversation with someone or when you're in a phone call or in a meeting or, you know, uh, something's maybe going a little sideways, mm. a little challenging in a, uh, you know, an interaction or a communication. So the, should we just do it? Yeah. yeah. And, and for this, you can close your eyes if you want, but I mean, I just want to give you the energetics. So something you practice doing in real time, right in the moment. Okay. So the first step you'll be familiar with, it's called heart focused breathing. Right? So focus your attention in the area of the heart and imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area. Breathe in a little slower and deeper than usual. Just find an, an easy rhythm that's comfortable. Heart focus breathing. And just do the, the heart focus breathing for at least a few breath cycles to really draw your attention down to the, the area of the heart. Now, the second step, I want to activate feelings of kindness, appreciation, genuine connection, or an attitude of deep listening. Let's just set with that a little bit and just breathe in as you're doing the heart focused breathing. Activate the a feeling of kindness, appreciation, genuine connection, or an attitude of deep listening. That that we want to take into that conversation or that interaction we're having. Now, the next and last step, we want to radiate those heart qualities to raise your vibration and help lift the energy field that surrounds you. Hey, so we'll kind of cut it a little short, but the, the point is to practice that, you know, and especially if you're familiar with the heart lock-in, you can kind of take that into, but break it in real time, eyes open while, right while you're having a, an interaction or a conversation that could be with a clerk at the grocery store, right? Or in a staff meeting or in a couple's context, whatever. Deep listening. Deep not, listening. Not, not trying to give you a hint or anything. Send some messages for uh, more advice later. <laughs> All right. 
Oh, probably yeah. so, probably something us men need more practice at than yeah. yeah. That <laughs> is, I do believe, a general truth. Yes. Um, I would just love to hear, and our people, I think, would like to hear. Who are you? What's been your journey? How do you connect with Heart Math? What's the the big story? The legend. How do you arrive here? Oh hmm. uh, boy, that's. <laughs> question that that would take too long uh, <laughs> okay the brief version maybe um, the brief version well i was um, originally a communication engineer mm -hmm. for motorola and doing all that and we'll wind all that and was always asking questions like what is a magnetic field anyway mm -hmm. and this is in, when i was in school and and, and things um and never really was satisfied with the answers. You know, if you ask that at, at a university classroom in, in electrical engineering, you're going to get a mathematical formula that describes the behavior of an electric or magnetic field and waves and all this. But I was going, no, no, what, what is it? And no, no, don't ask that. <laughs> That's kind of what's really being said. You know? uh, well, it's true. I mean, you know, um, so anyway, that kind of my curiosity about that, I just, came, I just came in to the planet, you know, asking some of those kinds of deeper questions, led me to get reading a book or I bought a book in a bookstore at the actually University of Nebraska, uh, where I went to school and which kind of led me in eventually many years later into moving to California and getting a degree in consciousness studies. One of the first official, like granted, you know, the degrees in, in that kind of work. Which then got me into, you know, like things like meditation mm. and mindfulness and on the list goes on. So I, you know, but I also being pretty classically trained in electromagnetics and all that, you know, never quite fell, you know, into the new age, um, you know, ungrounded stuff. Uh, but pretty curious because I was finding some make sense kind of made things that made sense in those kinds of studies. And I eventually through that connection helped uh, bring spirulina to the world if you will if you're familiar with that and a lot of people aren't these days but back in the 80s uh, late 70s and 80s and the motive uh, for that group I was working with and I actually ran one of the, the companies that distributed you know the stuff to the to health food stores and all that was to feed the world's hungry populations and um, in 1982 I believe it was National Enquirer, Kind of helped engineer it, but uh, did a, a front page story on spirulina. Mm. And in the next the following two, and we'd built the company up to it. We were selling, you know, like one hundred fifty thousand a month, which is not bad, you know, from you know green algae to mm. people that had never heard of the stuff before. And the in that front page, you know, headline article about it. In the next two to three weeks, I and just the, the company I was the head of, we sold a little over twenty million dollars worth of spirulina. That's its own story, but mm -hmm. but of how that got pulled off, but in that short of time. But the, the the real story I'm wanting to tell you here to ask you your real question. I think you're asking me was took the profits of that um, and built a demonstration plant in Southern California out in the desert to actually prove that you could go feed the world's hungry populations by building spirulina plants to way ahead of our time. Big air air you know, solar powered kind of through the grounds and spray giant spray dryers to grow and spirulina and all this stuff. Wow. We did it. And it went absolutely nowhere <laughs> in terms of feeding the world's hungry populations. And the it's when I, in hindsight now, I can say looking backwards, it's when my idealism bubble got popped, mm -hmm. right? And to where, you know, because we, you know, I meditated and all this stuff and it's about consciousness and growing and the evolution of consciousness. And, you know, I knew all that stuff. I thought, well, that experience, because it was really blocked at political levels, people levels, squabbles, and, you know, and it's where I really realized that it's not about technology. We had it. It's about the evolution of consciousness at, at a global scale. Uh, I'll give you just another example of why I say that. It's a little bit off track, but, you know, after I got into heart math and helped found heart, heart helped Doc Childry, one of the people that helped him found the, the Heart Math Institute, I read that with less than 10% of the world's uh, budget for military budgets, defense budgets, we could feed and house and educate 
every person on earth. And I was never able to find the source for it until a couple of years ago when I met the author of the book, uh, The, the uh, Blueprint for Peace, and uh, who actually did the work on this. And I actually have a signed copy of her book now and all that. So, But she informed me that I was actually incorrect in that it was less than 10%. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, you want an illustration that it's a problem in consciousness. We don't need any new technologies to go figure out how to feed people, to house people, right? For, for less than what we're spending on bombs and war and defense, we can really solve most of the fundamental problems that are causing these issues to begin with. That's a problem in consciousness, right? In global consciousness. Anyway, so back to my journey there. I hope this isn't too long of an answer. But, wow. um, you did it. <laughs> so um, after that experience, and I said, oh, the heck with this humanitarian stuff. I'm going to go make money again. Um, so I started a company with a couple of friends or a friend of mine in uh, electrostatics, um, which became pretty successful in a fairly short time. And, and uh, anyway, it was a fun ride. Don't get me wrong. It was, uh, you know, we expanded rapidly and invented some new technologies for in, in that in the field of electrostatics. And, you know, a few years into that, I was kind of, my own heart was kind of, you know, in there going, yeah, another sports car in the driveway. Is that really what you care about? You know, and uh, even though it's fun, don't. Really <laughs> um, anyway, no. <laughs> and that is at the time that I, around the time I uh, met back actually through some connections of the earlier time period with, uh, you know, the degree in consciousness studies and all that, Doc Childry. Because I'd kind of, uh, in hindsight, I knew I had vowed to myself, I'm not going to get involved in uh, stuff for the world and humanitarian type things, unless it's something that can really help evolve consciousness. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I'm wasting my time. I might as well have fun and, you know, travel around the world and have sports cars and what, what have you, you know, make money. Anyway, uh, through that, some mutual friends, I met uh, Doc Childry and, and uh, I happened to be, he was living on the East coast at the time and some business out there or a company and stop. I'll go meet this guy. You know, stop by for you. I'd spend an hour or two. And three days later, <laughs> literally um i left in that um, through through that um is what i really learned more about from through him and, I, and by the way I, I could way whip energy through the heart chakra and all the shock all that stuff right i've been practicing for a long time but, but i got um he helped facilitate you know heart opening in me that was at a much deeper level and and uh, pretty cool it's hard to describe experiences but uh and i really got on to that oh this this heart stuff is not a metaphor this is this really is that way, like you know the books talk about. But uh, there was a there was something new about it, a new frequency, I'll call it, and, uh, involved in that. So then I started bringing this is long before heart math existed, right? And uh, so, but I brought back some of the ideas and principles that I'd learned in, in that period into my company, you know, and working with you know and I had I think I had eighty people that reported directly to me in the company at that time. And you know, so much of my time had become dealing with employee squabbles and issues and this and that, some things. But anyway, I started integrating some of the ideas. And I can honestly tell you that in the following three months, I made more personal growth on multiple levels than I had probably in well, 12, 15 years of meditation and, and practice. And, not, and I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down meditation in those practices. I got a lot out of it. But at the same time, I could do a great meditation in the morning and be, you know, zooming around the universe and, you know, all that and be pissed off, frustrated and kind of way out of my heart by the time I even got to work through the traffic jams and, you know, all the crazy drivers and stuff, you know, let alone when I walked into the office and all that. So anyway, um, that became how I then basically, uh, when uh, Doc decided to uh, move to California and found what became then HeartMath, um, he invited me along with some others to join him in that adventure. So I basically figured out a way to very quickly sell the company for way less than it was worth, but sold it to the employees and uh, helped uh, move to Boulder Creek. And the rest is history, so they speak. I guess. Wow, that's amazing. Uh -huh. I so want to start by asking you all these questions about the heart, but I feel like you're the right guy to answer this question. You are a folklore, but so is Doc. Like, I feel like he's the man that's like completely hidden behind the scenes. Could you just tell me a little bit about Doc Children? Like, you see this amazing guy? Is he actually yeah. real? <laughs> that, well, but you're right. Doc does stay hidden behind the scenes yes. um, by choice. And trust me, it's not because that if he wanted to, that he couldn't have a huge personality based following out there. Mm. 
Um, he could <laughs> easily. In the very founding of HeartMath, um, he basically kind of got me and a few other kind of folks together and said, um, y'all are going to have to be the voice and spokesman for HeartMath. And this, the reason, uh, you know, this is probably the first time it's ever been said publicly. The um, hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, but he said, be, basically, I will not allow HeartMath to become a personality-based system. Because, you know, the personality goes away and, the heart, and this is much bigger. This is about planetary change and consciousness of the planet. And wow. About people in their own hearts and uh, wow. really helping put science to, to, you know, all the stuff we're doing. So that that was the choice and the reason that uh, he uh, kind of stays tucked behind the scenes. But it's very involved, trust me. Wow. That gave me chills hearing that answer. So thank you. For- yeah, that is, that's actually just the coolest mark of somebody who really wants what heart math is and not just to be like the famous guy which is pretty cool uh he's obviously very coherent <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I would say he once you get to know him and spend time with him i've been hanging out with doc for i don't know 30 some years now <clears throat> either probably the most by far i would say from my own personal experience most caring consistently caring person mm-hmm. about people but also the planet and what's going on on the planet and, and really here to help mm-hmm. you know facilitate the shift which is a shift in consciousness. Mm. Mm. So I have so many questions, but I, the thing that I really love, and one of my first introductions to you was the stuff about intuition, mm-hmm. where people are watching the photos and mm. they're sensing something before because their heart has intuition. Mm-hmm. So I would love to, I think you'd be a really good person to just explain intuition, what the three types are. I don't think we've ever talked about that mm-hmm. in this group. And then what your research has shown. Uh, sure, I'll try and be brief because that could be a whole long <laughs> story. But they're basically what our research and, and many others uh, as well, uh, I would say, suggest that there, like you just mentioned, um, the, uh, is that there are three types of intuition. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, I've actually learned through doing a lot of presentations on it. It's better to go ahead and lay them out up front. Otherwise, it gets all muddled in the, the back end of it. And I won't go into a lot of examples in detail, but the first type I call it, well, it's called in general implicit knowledge or implicit learning. And these are the type of intuitions that are all based on brain, what the brain, you know, stored memories in the brain come implicit because we, we're not conscious access to them. And that uh, we encounter a problem and we're, we're doing pattern matching to those old stored memories and we find a solution and aha, you know. Um, so, I mean, I give you a lot of examples, but one that might help ground it for people is this is also underlies what is often kind of referred to as expert knowledge. Mm-hmm. Many, many examples, but the nurse, and you, you, you know, you've probably heard this in your certification training, but who walks into a patient's room, but the nurse has been around the block, right? Been on a while and walks in and goes, oh, that's pa- oh this patient's going to code in the next hour or so. Mm-hmm. And usually right. And a new nurse sitting ne- standing next to her, it hasn't been around as long as they both. How do you know that? You know, and she goes, I, I don't know. I just know it. Right? So that would be that kind of, but she's learned to recognize certain patterns of whatever that is signals. And it's the, this is the type of intuition that's studied um, in safe to study in academic settings, right? Because it's all based on the brain and hidden memories and all this, right? So most of the arguments these days are around what's the process of the pattern recognition, how what brain systems do what. Then there's another type that I call energetic sensitivity. Uh, which we've done a fair amount of work on. And this is our, I'm going to say our nervous system's ability to detect and respond to very real, and in most cases, measurable signals from the environment. Mm-hmm. And I would actually put empathy, for example, in this category. Mm-hmm. right? Because we know now that the heart especially radiates magnetic fields and they, these affect other people. right? And so we're able to detect those signals. Or there are actually really are people uh, in fact, I just uh, ran, I got interviewed by one that had this ability not too long ago. We were talking that can feel earthquakes coming. Uh, you know, but basically, we know now that there's a lot of literature in another field, you know, another silo, of, if you will, that has measured changes in the Earth's magnetic fields before earthquakes. So again, it's our nervous system detecting those subtle changes and hadn't, hadn't making the association with what that's associated with, like in this case, earthquake. But it can be lots of things. So energetic sensitivity. Then the third type, or, you know, I'll give you another example of energetic sensitivity. Um, have you ever felt like somebody was behind you and staring at you? Mm-hmm. You feel them, right? And you turn around, and sure enough, um, 
And there's actually been a few studies on that, that it is a real thing. So um, that would be another example, I think, in that I'd put in that energetic sensitivity category. And then the third type is non-local, what I call non-local intuition. Hopefully you'll come up with a better name someday, but these are the type of intuitions that you can't write off through the other two types. Usually something to do with future, you know, across time or across space, like the mother who knows their children or their child is in harm's way or doing something they shouldn't be doing on the other side of town or the other side of the planet. Distance doesn't seem to matter. Right. So those are, there's a gazillion examples of that. I'm sure everybody listening here has had real examples. You know, you're, you think of somebody's name that you were childhood friends with or something or a colleague or whatever, army buddy, whatever that you haven't thought of in years, but their name pops up and then you get a phone call or a letter from them in the next hour or day or so. Mm -hmm. um, and on and on, those kind of stories go. And examples. So the... I would also put in that category the, the really the real intuition that I think you're asking about and the, the stuff that really counts. And that's our inner guidance system. So to me, I'll just kind of cut through, if I, if I may hear a, lot, a long scientific story, but it's the kind of intuitions that flow from, I'll just call it our larger self. You can call it your higher self, your soul, your spirit, whatever you want. But it, it's that almost like a radio signal communication between your larger self and the energetic heart and then down to the DNA and all the systems in the body. And that's, I mean, who are we talking to when we go deep inside and you know, talk to ourselves anyway? Um, and when I'm talking about the brain, I'm talking about that deeper part of ourselves now. So that's um, the three types. And the one of the reasons we got into doing actual research around this, you know, I'm talking about very rigorous lab-based kind of hooking people up to all kinds of electrodes and stuff research. Well, it was one of the things that we were hearing and still do to this day, and I'm sure you might have your own stories about, is when people start practicing um, co the coherence techniques and practices and getting more heart coherent and um, that their intuition, they, a lot of people have to literally say, God, my intuition is on steroids. This is, this is not subtle. This is a big difference. And, and the second thing that usually comes out of their mouth is in synchronicities. It become a way of life now. And uh, that's because of the intuition. But so we did a, a number of studies over a few years. The first one that you were referring to, um, Leo, was that it was based on a protocol that uh, a friend of mine, Dean Radin, had developed. Um, when we extended it a lot more. He was looking at skin conductance, and um, people are sit the participants are seated, seated at a computer, and you press a button, and then you see a blank screen for so many seconds, and a photograph shows up. And the, the photos, the images that the participants see are derived from what's called the International Effective Picture Set. Basically, just a, a set of pictures that have well, been well-researched for the type of emotions they evoke and the uh, intensity of the emotion. So we use pictures from the two extreme ends. Um, one set on that one end, you've got really yucky pictures. There's a scientific term for you, right? Um, you know, bad guys with knives at a woman's throat or car accidents or snakes striking at the screen. And, you know, pretty edgy, about as edgy as you'd want to show to someone. So those are the, emo the kind of negative emotional type pictures that arouse those. And on the other end of the picture set are things like bunny rabbits and flowers and nature scenes and things like that. The key point here is that the uh, these way these pictures are selected, it's in, it's in a, an order that you can, there's no way that you can consciously try and predict what's going to come. You can't learn the, from the past what the future is going to be. And they're, true, they're truly randomly selected after the data is collected from the brain and heart and all the physiology, right? So even the computer doesn't know what picture is going to show up next, right? And it's a lot of, I won't go into all the details, but a lot of care is taking to not have any kind of what's called sensory leakage and these kinds of things. And so what um, Dr. Radin had done was looking at skin, skin conductance and, and had found that before you see the picture, the skin conductance would change in a way that was predictive of the future picture. Way, but way more than chance, right? Um, so he shared this with me. He hadn't published it yet. And uh, when he was down here for a visit once, and we thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, this is something we could use to study. He was calling it a precognition. I said, yeah, nothing, nothing to do with cognition. This is more about intuition. Um, it was a term we used. So we, we added a lot to that basic protocol of having people the pictures and measuring the physiology, where we were measuring brain waves, you know, full cap brain waves, and of course ECG, and, and of course skin conductance, and, and some other measures, as well to see if we could 
more deeply understanding, the, you know, the process where what happens first and then what's the process, what's the flow of information. And I was actually surprised. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the real, the real story of what happened. So we, we did this with 30 people, the protocol, and we did it twice. We uh, had the people come into the lab and we'd wire them up and nice to them, you know, you know, not <laughs> a date or anything, but new kind of normal, what we call normal state, right? And it takes a while. It takes a while to hook all this stuff up and get everything measured and calibrated. You know, it's like a 20 minute process or so to get someone hooked up. And then we also had them do it a second time, but then we had them uh, shift in, do a heart lock in basically and set their in a coherent state. I think three or five minutes, something like that before they went through the protocol. Right. Mm -hmm. So normal state versus being in a coherent state before the experiment. And that was all done in a counterbalanced order and stuff. But anyway, um, I'm giving you that background because when we had all this data collected and we started analyzing it and we looked at the skin conductance data and we did not see what Dean had seen. We had failed to replicate his findings. We were not happy campers. <laughs> yeah, hundreds of hours have gone into this at this point, right, into this experiment. And I said, okay, well, we've got tools, you know, we'll self-regulate here and it is what it is and move forward with the data analysis. So next we looked at the heart data. Uh, the beat to beat heart rate data or, or HRV, and as you would know. And voila, we had a huge, what's called pre stimulus effect, you know, before you see the picture. I mean, way, a big, big effect, a lot, much larger than what Dean had seen in the skin duct state in his studies. So at this point, I had a call with Dean, probably won't mind me telling the story. So how it really happened, we kind of shared this with Dean and had a phone call, and he goes, Oh, by the way, I guess I forgot to mention that we screen out people with meditation experience and self-regulation practices because they don't have a skin conductance response. <laughs> uh, we screened four people <laughs> because we wanted them to be able to get coherent, right, in, in that one protocol. So anyway, it was kind of like Dean. <laughs> 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 but it was kind of fun, actually, in hindsight, you know, after all that, the way it actually went, because we, also, we went on to explain why and how that happens, uh, the reason that they don't have a skin conductance response. But anyway, the next surprise came. Well, um, I shouldn't say it was a surprise, but it, now we, the next step was looking at the the brainwave data because we had just looked at skin conductance and heart data at that point. So now we started looking at the adding the brain analysis, and voila, it was pretty clear that the shift in the heart rhythm in, pre in that pre stimulus period was happening prior to any measurable changes in brain activity. Mm hmm. <laughs> This is pretty cool. Um, so then we added another level of analysis, which is called heartbeat evoke potential analysis. And this is a technique where you, I won't go into the, the gory detail, but basically it allows you to literally trace the flow of what's called afferent or sending information from up through the nervous system, from the heart to the brain. It goes here, then it goes here across, you know, both in time and location. So you can actually trace the flow and, and sequence of the, these ascending heart signals. And so we looked at that period, but to be, then you did see a brain response, but it was much later, you know, seconds later. So then we, that's where we looked at the, used the heartbeat of our potentials and were able to show that uh, for this non-local or intuitive information, heart gets the information first, sends a measurably different neural signal to the brain, depending upon what the future picture is going to be. Then you have a body response, right? Where you consciously feel it. The gut feeling, the hair on the back of the neck, right? So the gut gets the credit, right? But it's really heart, brain, body response. And if you've had self-regulation practice, we we know that and we self-inhibit the stress response. Mm -hmm. So we're actually able to show that through all the, I won't go into the details, but the, but, but the, looking at the brain level activity. So that was the, and if you were, when the same participants went through it in a coherent state prior to the, the, the pro, going through this protocol, that channel between, I'll just call it between the heart and brain was radically different. You were seeing direct signaling to the frontal cortex, very rapid and, and dramatically different than in your normal state. So I, I we interpreted this by looking at your, uh, but basically you're, you're sitting, the, the heart's going right to the frontal part of our brain where we get the the, the, the information about the future. Wow. Does that help? I mean, I probably, it maybe, probably spent more time explaining that than I should have, but <laughs> no. No, it was great. I just very quickly, I would love to ask what the you said that it changed what happened with the information going to the brain. 
-hmm. What about with coherent people with their skin test? So their body, what was Oh, that? well, you, you don't, you, the skin connectance, you, that's why I'm saying it doesn't really change. That's, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Because you're, you, the, the, we actually unconsciously know that this is an experiment and we don't really need to be putting our body through the stress response. If you've had those, those kind of practices. Mm -hmm. um, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I would love to know um, what happens when multiple people come together and practice heart coherence, because um, mm -hmm. we're doing this as a group. Yeah. And what is the intention of heart math with getting a lot of people to meditate together? I think you have the goal. Yeah. People. Uh, OK, uh, I can go there before I do. Means you asked that question, the experiment I just told you about. Yeah. Right the intuition and we went on to, to do a lot of studies and other protocols and all that but a group of all places well let me uh, i'll try and be brief here but after we published those studies but and by the way the way i got it published back and this is in the 90s right to, to was to in peer-reviewed scientific journals that that work was to say that the heart and brain later but uh, seem to have access to a field of information outside the boundaries of time and space perfectly acceptable language at that time for scientific journals because you know non-locality and all this stuff had been experimentally proven at that point just wasn't supposed to happen in wet hearts and brains and things but anyway that i got a call from uh the dean of the school of entrepreneurship um it's a university that just focuses on helping people become entrepreneurs in australia and um we ended up having a fun relationship but um uh, he says, yeah, we got these characters, is what he calls them. Mm -hmm. We've been studying for years, these repeat entrepreneurs. And it, it, your study really intrigues us because what we have found in studying these groups, you know, at MIT and Harvard and England, you know, these different groups that they've worked with, is that the most common characteristic from, from these repeat entrepreneurs, you know, the, the ones that are really good at it, do it multiple times, is that 80% was the number say that they rely on their intuition when making the final decision about a business opportunity. Of course, they look at the spreadsheets and all that, but when a rubber meets the road, it's their intuition they trust and go with. So we want to be able to measure this. We want to see if we can measure using your protocols, um, these characters, you know, uh, versus, you know, accountants and risk avoidance and see if there's a difference. And so we went down that track and yes, that we, we, we did, but the, why was I telling you that story? There was a reason that was in your question. Oh, um, I know what it was. So a group uh, in Iran, of all places at that time, it's kind of before Iran is like it is now, <laughs> um, was also working with entrepreneurs. And they did, they added a neat twist to our study where they had two people in the same experimental protocol, you know, that so the computer, they'd see the same pictures and all that in the future. And they found that when you work in a group setting like that, that you have a much greater, significantly greater pre-stimulus result. So when we when we come together in groups, especially in the heart, and if we're coherent, it might be my add-on, there actually is a measurable group intuition that we can kind of pull out uh, of the effect. So be really working in a in a heart kind of based collaborative team or group, there really is this collective intuition that we can work together to pull in. I know that wasn't your question, but I it, it reminded me Kyle of it, so I wanted to Amazing. add that. No, I appreciate me. you adding that. That's beautiful. Um, so me. See if I can answer your question. So then, um, you know, we've known this since day one. I mean, when I first walked up 30 some years ago on Doc Childry, you know, and uh, it was very clear, you know, in his vision of what the future was going to bring, the stress on the planet and the shift that was in the starting, just starting to happen back then and and all that, that the, the planet was going to need a system to help people navigate these times and to um, that needed tools and techniques to really access their, their heart. I mean, one thing I would say that I think that, um, because really everything we talk about, I'm going to be a little bit random here, if that's okay. That random. Most of what we, te we teach in heart math, you know, about forgiveness and appreciation and kindness and uh, talking about the heart as the access point to our, our larger self, that's been around in books and teachings forever. Kind of written off as metaphor and all oh, that's good, cute stuff, right? <laughs> um, well, I mean, really, I mean, you know, a soft skills as it's called, you know, in, in the business world. Well, uh, it was a completely different perspective, I think, emerging now that this is really the inner technology that we need to, to, to really go to our next level of evolution and of consciousness. And so the two parts to this one is, yeah, we've got to 
to have programs like the resilience advantage that you guys are certified in. And, and I so appreciate um, our certified trainer community uh, that you're part of, because it's how do you, you got to, you finally got to get to the street mm-hmm. right? and people need to learn the skills, right. And, and learn how to become more self-regulated, but self-regulated from that larger place in ourself. So we're not doing it because we should, you know, because somebody told us to, it has to be that inner wisdom. But anyway, the other part two of that, these two two things work together is they're really from my perspective i'll say anyway uh, there really is an energetic system that we certainly have in our own individual beings but also at the planet level and one of the things we can measure i'm not saying it's the only way we're interconnected but certainly one of the ways that we're interconnected that we can measure and do research around is the magnetic environment we all live in mm-hmm. magnetic fields of the earth and they have resonant frequencies they vibrate and as it turns out, we discovered this uh, through our own research by putting what's it's called the Global Coherence Monitoring System. These are magnetometers that are specifically designed to measure the rhythms of the Earth. And I wish we didn't have to do this ourselves. <laughs> Very expensive and time-consuming. But So we've got sites around the around the Earth now in places like northern Canada, one here in Boulder Creek, California, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, South Africa, Lithuania, probably forgetting some, but that are has allowed us to really look at human physiology and and animals in some cases as well and and look at the interrelationships between the field we live in and the vibrations in the field and as it turns out one of the primary resonant frequencies of the earth's magnetic the geo what's called geomagnetic field you know if you remember back in school you put iron filings on a plate right you put your magnet under it and they line those iron filings line up in parallel lines to show you whatever your shape is so it also, that simple little high school experiment or grade school now probably lets us visualize what are called magnetic field lines. And well, here's the thing. I, I actually didn't even learn this when I was a communication engineer, you know, professionally dealing with magnetic fields to carry information around the world is that it's called field line resonances. The, the magnetic fields, you can actually pluck them and they vibrate like guitar strings. Mm. And what's vibrating the strings of earth is the solar wind coming by and the earth turning in that. But one of the the primary resonant frequencies of the field lines vibrating is a frequency that I hope you will recognize is 0.1 hertz, Mm -hmm. right? Which is the same frequency as our heart rhythms when we're in that heart coherent state. Mm -hmm. Accident? (laughs) Probably not, right? (laughs) And, you know, I think for, for most people, it's probably not a big jump to at least intuitively get that it's probably a good thing to be in sync. Mm. The, the rhythms of that we live in mm-hmm. and um for one in fact one of my mentors um later in my career um for a guy named franz hallberg which i wouldn't expect you to know that name but he's the guy who co- literally coined made up and coined the term circadian rhythm oh. and uh, so uh, dr hallberg he, he passed away probably what four or five years ago now and um suggested i mean i could tell all kinds of stories about him and some of my other good friends and mentors but he actually suggests that we have the biological rhythms that we do, us and the we, which we also share with most animals, right? Because we evolved in these frequencies of the earth. Mm-hmm. It's not an accident. And more and more studies are now starting to come out that really indicate why actually it's a good thing to be in sync uh, with the rhythms of the earth. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit off track to your question, Kyle. Sorry, but what uh, we're suggesting here in, in, with the Global Consciousness Project, our Global Coherence Initiative, sorry, that's got two different things in my that we're involved in <laughs> is um, that be, through resonance principles to kind of keep this short that not only are we affected by the rhythms in the fields we live in but we are also coupled with and feeding information into the field so there really is a i call it kind of the planetary information field that we are all feeding information into right so when we um in a it's wonderful when you come together like we do in, on the Global Coherence Initiative, full moon care focus, as we call them, you know, hundreds of people around the planet, you know, get in coherence and, and consciously um, radiate more, uh, more com- love and compassion types of frequencies, literal frequencies into the planetary field environment. That helps uplift the field and all other living beings in it. But we're always coupled to the field. That's what I'm suggesting. So my one of how I usually end interviews and things, not that we're ending necessarily, but is that uh, I hope this research and why we do it helps people learn how it truly interconnected we are mm-hmm. in a measurable way. And that what we're feeding the field matters. Mm-hmm. And that in a measurable way that we 
then become more self-responsible for what we're feeding the field. Yeah. What are we doing throughout the day, our day-to-day -day lives? Are we really feeding the field more compassion, more kindness? You know, or are we maybe drifting off into more frustrations and my because my to-do list isn't getting done fast enough and <laughs> you know those interactions and the judgments of course this is a group that doesn't judge we just assess <laughs> um right but you get my point right because that's what's feeding the field and uh this i think this is because both are important right you got to be teaching the techniques and really helping people discover their heart and live a more coherent life mm. but the feed but that's it's a giant feedback system mm. The field also matters because that's affecting people at an unseen level, whether they know it or understand it or not. Well, thank you. Anyway, that was a long, long-winded well, answer to your question. So, that was great, and I think honestly, we could probably interview with you like ten more times if you're cool with that. <laughs> but I, I would like to just end with the simple question of how can our followers support you um, in what you're doing? Well, our our mission really is um, about a shift in global consciousness, and so practice, practice the techniques to um, really learn about heart-based living and, and really practice following that you're in a guidance system, the guidance of your heart. And it, what would be really helpful, we are a nonprofit. All of the research that I've told you about that we've done is through funding uh, donors. Uh, the kind of work we do is not going to be funded by NIH or the government. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not, not going to happen. <laughs> and so um, anything helps. Yeah. What keeps our research active and going is uh, as people like uh, you and the listeners. Beautiful. Yeah, we'll send so, something it, 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 to get yeah, and, it, and, and, and I way get it's tough times that people can't afford to even, you know, I don't, anything helps, but I don't, I'm having to learn how to even let people know that we're a nonprofit and funding helps. But it, it, for those that can't afford that or aren't motivated, your energetic support, mm. feed the field with more love, more compassion, more kindness, yeah. learn, learn how to get along. <laughs> yeah. Others, you know what I mean. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I hope you will come back because we have yeah. five thousand more questions. Seriously, <laughs> so many more questions. So thank you, Roland. Sure. This was incredible. Well, was well, I, I'm sorry if I was too long, too long winded <laughs> on my answers, so you couldn't get to the other questions. But no, it was, was great. Perfect. You just have to come back. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, thank you, All everybody. Right. We're sending love to everybody. All right, take care, everyone.